First of all, thank you very much indeed for inviting me to speak to such a distinguished audience. I much appreciate it. Um, for the last five years, um, myself and scholars from the Yale Centre for British Art and a great many other independent scholars and curators have been working on a research project to explore this painting, The Past and Treasure, and the world within it. It's been an extremely wide-ranging project, um, covering everything from the past and the family themselves, the artist of the painting, their collection, and the home in which they lived, Oxnead Hall in Norfolk. The painting is an extremely strange one, as you can see, um, quite unique. It contains many elements of the typical um, mid-17th century Vanitas Dutch still life, and some elements of collector's cabinet paintings, but also entirely idiosyncratic elements. As you will see, the perspective is extremely odd. Um, I don't know how, actually, is there enough light? Can, can, can everyone see it okay? Oh, yeah. Yes, that's fine. Um, the, there are two mysterious um, figures in the painting, a great many musical instruments, timepieces, um, the very dark area in the middle, which is actually a th th uh, looking glass, although you can't really see anything in it, um, and all surrounded by this rich red drapery. It was commissioned either by William Paston, pictured here from the his portrait in Felbrick Hall in Norfolk, or his eldest son, Robert. Uh, these are the 17th century generation of the Paston family who are probably best known um, these days for their 15th century uh, surviving letters, um, which uh, document medieval life in, in, in great depth. Um, th these are the same guys just a couple of hundred years later. The Norfolk seat, where they spent most of their time, although they also had a couple of different houses in London and various other properties in Norfolk, was Oxnead Hall. Only one third of it now stands. Um, the nearest we have to what it looked like is this early 19th century watercolour by John A.D. Repton, the art architect and antiquary, um, who was Humphrey Repton's son. Um, he did a couple of different watercolours when the hall, which had been abandoned since 1732, was about to be demolished. Um, he reconstructed it as accurately as he knew how. To, um, what stands today is the kind of the part that you can't see um, reaching back on the right hand side. Um, but uh, this is a, the gardens are still um, quite intact. The present owners are um, excavating what foundations are left and are restoring them. The difference between our painting and the usual Vanitas still life tradition paintings is that the objects are known to be real. They're not simply stock objects put in there to make a point. For example, this cup, um, seen held um, on its side by the African servant, has always stayed with the painting. Um, it was given to us at Norwich Castle in 1947 by a Norfolk family who had, um, since the 18th century, um, had in their possession quite a lot of material from the Paston's collection. I'll be telling you a little more about that later on. But because this cup was, has always remained with the painting, it offered the first clues that other items might also be real. By the, 19, the 90s, other, uh, the four other surviving items were also um, recognised. Robert Wenley, who was now at the, 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 the Barber Institute of Art in the, the Birmingham, had studied the silver in the painting, and he published an article in the Journal of Norfolk Archaeology, and also one in Silver Studies Journal in 2005. And since realising that um, several of the objects were real, that gave one the clue that perhaps all the others were as well. It was the, the ambition, the greatest ambition of my predecessor as, as Keeper of Art and myself too when I took over in 2012 to put together an exhibition which uh, brought back together as many of these objects as we could. 
These two flagons, of which uh, the one is shown in the picture, um, they bear both the Paston coat of arms and also the arms of the Cook family, which is another Norfolk family. Um, Bridget Paston married Edward Cook in 1592. Um, so this is probably, um, a, uh, sorry, sorry, 1597. So this is probably a c c commemoration of that event. Similarly, in the Wax Museum, we have this mounted Nautilus cup. You can uh, notice the shell has been replaced. In the painting, uh, obviously the edge has been cut down and the pattern coat of arms are placed inside the shell. Um, and is it, oh, sorry, it's shaking a bit. Um, the original shell has gone at some pre previous point in time. This work, um, inside it, um, you can still see the past and coat of arms. Um, this is a, an extremely important piece. Um, it's the only one which has a, um, only, only one of the shell cups in the painting, which can be datable. It's attributed to the workshop of Nicholas de Greber in Delft. It's now in the Prinzenhof Museum. But right inside the monster's jaws, engraved on the shell, is the past and coat of arms. Here we have a mounted turban shell flask. How to go about finding out about this lost collection? 11 inventories survive in varying degrees of completeness and they date between around 1663 and 1703. Some of them are in the Norfolk Record Office, others in Cambridge University Library, uh, others in the National Archives. And they are mainly of Oxnead Hall, but also of some of the Paston's other residences. Um, similarly, some patchy correspondence survives of Robert Paston, um, which has been transcribed and edited. And this also gives an insight into the Paston's lives. But it's the inventories which have been most useful from these, it's been possible to start to reconstruct a little bit of what the Pastons had. And it becomes quite clear um, that the 17th century generation of the family must have spent vast sums on amassing this most extraordinary collection. At Oxnead, they housed in their best closet, the kind of princely Kunstkammer on a European model you would really not expect in the UK uh, at this time. The painting, with its 12 objects, clearly shows only a fraction. Um, on the inventory of 1673, 57 shell cups are recorded, 25 vessels of mother of pearl, 30 vessels of rock crystal, 22 of agate plus other hard stones, coconut cups, ostrich egg cups, amber, pietra dura, ivory, enamel, painting, sculpture, some porcelain, not very much, naturalia, plus other items of which descriptions are more ambiguous. So how could, how could this be? This is an extremely strange occurrence. Um, there were, two, there were t t t two Pastons who were notable travellers. Um, this guy is probably the first one, Clement Paston, um, who, the Pastons were an upwardly mobile family throughout the 16th century. They did their very best to increase their wealth and status. Um, Clement was very good at it. He was a soldier and a sailor, and he managed to capture a French ship with a noble captain, for which he, he managed to obtain an excellent ransom. Um, and on the proceeds of that, plus his timely marriage to the wealthy heiress, whom you see kneeling by his tomb, um, he built Oxnead Hall around 1570. But he lived until 1598. And... He was travelling around Europe and so would have begun to come across such objects of this kind. So there's a closer view of the Delft Cup we saw earlier. Um, interestingly, this cup not only has the past and coat of arms on it, but you can see that the stem of the cup is formed from two satires. One is playing a shawm, the other is singing from a songbook. And you can't see it in the painting, but in the real object, um, one of the scholars, the music specialists, who has been working on this um, project, um, Professor Joe Wainwright from York, 
has deciphered the song which the satire happens to be singing. And it's by a composer called Clemens Nonpapa. Um, it's, a, it's a love song, a kind of a, 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 kind of a lamenting love song. But the, the, the fact that the composer is called Clemens, Clement, makes one wonder if it was, in fact, Clement who commissioned the, this cup, um, as he was the only pastor who could have been in the right place and at the right time. Similarly, the rock crystal jug, um, now in the Schroeder collection, um, with the late antique body, but the 16th century silver gilt mounts, this may possibly also have been um, a Clement Paston commission. Obviously, it isn't provable. Um, but one thing that we do know about Clement is that he acquired, at some point, um, a large collar made of gilt snakes entwined. So it was quite an odd sounding object and it disappeared. He left it to his nephew. It's been, no one's heard of it um, since the early 17th century. But is it possible that the snake could be a reference to that collar? Um, although this isn't in the painting, we know that it was in the Paston's collection because it, both it and the Delft Cup just now are described on the um, inventory of Horace Walpole. He purchased both of these for his collection at Strawberry Hill. However, the candidate for acquiring most of the objects on the Paston's collection is, is most likely to be William. Um, his mother's family, the, 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 another Norfolk family known as the, the Nivets, were keen antiquarians, and so he would have been um, kind of surrounded by objects of interest from an early age. But he also was an, ex an extremely adventurous t t traveler. He went abroad, um, 1638 to 1639, and he went much further than most people did at that time. I mean, obviously, he's a century um, before the grand um, tour was, was, was really getting going. Um, but we only know that he traveled at all, not because he left a diary. He, he left nothing to tell us where he went. But Nicholas Stone the Younger, um, an architect, and his brother Henry Stone, an artist, went with him um, a, a, a certain part of the way. Nicholas the Elder, who was a well-known mason, he was already working for William in Oxnead Hall during the 1630s, um, embellishing the house, adding statues and garden fountains. And William's, sorry, um, Nicholas's two sons were travelling to Italy. They met William in Florence, and Nicholas the Younger um, just goes into great detail in his diary about what they, what they um, happened to see there. there are, there's Nicholas the Younger and Henry Stone. As it happens, um, both Nicholas the Younger and Henry left sketchbooks, which are now in the collection of the Sir John Stone Museum, and both of which we've been able to borrow for the exhibition. Um, this is a, a, a group of English gentlemen, presumably English, um, if Henry was with them, um, sightseeing um, in, in Rome. And um, the air of realism is kind of augmented by the fact that there's probably a the beggar on the ground there. And one wonders whether um, William Paston happened to be with them at the time. Nicholas Stone the Younger um, did, left his sketchbook with architectural sketches. And one of the pages um, in this sketchbook, of which, which was a drawing of a villa in Rome made in March 1639, actually says in the margin, made at the request of Mr. Paston. Um, and while in Florence, they met Ferdinando de' Medici, the Grand Duke, who was the same age as William and who clearly shared his interests. Um, according to Nicholas Stone, they were privileged to, 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 to visit the gallery of the Duke's collection, where, according to William, he said he'd never seen so many rarities in one place in all his travels. The example of Ferdinand may have inspired William later to begin c c collecting objects for, for, for Oxnead Hall. They also visited the ducal workshops, where Nicholas sketched the machinery for creating works in Pietra Dura, and they commissioned a plaque 
in Pietra Dura of the arms of the Paston family, which is now in Oxborough Hall in Norfolk with the Paston Beddingfield family, who are the last surviving remnants of the Pastons. The uh, quotes in um, italics are descriptions on the inventories, by the way. They also um, came by this tabletop, um, which is the, the four ovals are also the Paston coat of arms. Um, and there was indeed a rich stone table inlaid um, in the Paston's collection. And one assumes it must have been this one. Um, it's quite interesting. It would be very interesting to be able to find out more about Ferdinand and William's relationship. They were, they were both interested in arts and sciences. And it was it, he, either William managed to commission these pieces without Ferdinand knowing, or else it was a kind of a gracious gift perhaps from Ferdinand to, to, to William, which given the difference in their ranks was um, you know, quite a favor. Um, this design, um, Simon Jervis has, has written the, the catalog entry for um, this object, and he notes it's in the style um, probably emanating from the workshop of uh, Jacopo Ligozzi, the design. And it's most similar to this piece in the Kunsthistorisches Museum in Vienna. That one is somewhat more elaborate, obviously, and it may be that this one um, was meant to be, they left it blank in the corners in order to fit the coats of arms in. Um, it has been pointed out that the spaces are perhaps not, the, the, the way the design is integrated is perhaps not of the highest quality, um, but in a, it, it's still extremely in, interesting to be able to see it. This table had been in a private collection, it, it, it still is. It had kind of vanished from um, anybody's sight for over a decade. Um, we managed to track it down for the exhibition. In fact, if uh, I, I think the, the owner is interested in sell it and, selling it and I want to buy it for our collection if I can. Nicholas Stone recorded that William took ship from Livorno to Alexandria. He also went to Cairo, Jerusalem, and on to Constantinople, which was extremely unusual indeed for the time to go so far before heading back to Florence. After he left the Stones, he returned to England, but we don't know what route he took back to the UK. The red um, is quite hard to see. Um, we only know a certain amount, obviously, ab about William's journey. There is Florence there. Um, but we know that he took, he took ship and went down to Alexandria and to Cairo, Jerusalem, Damascus. But when, once he came back to Florence, we don't know whether he came back the same way he came or whether he chose to visit other collections in Europe. Um, it's quite frustrating not to be able to find out more about his journeys. But from the, uh, um, I'll, I'll be talking more about the contents of the collection in a minute, but from the very international um, European nature of the collections, it seems quite possible that he would have visited other princely collections as well as those in, uh, as well as those of the Grand Duke. After the Civil War started, we know that William also went back um, to Holland, to Amsterdam and Rotterdam um, in 1643 to 44. And there is quite a strong Dutch slant to the collection. So he may well have picked up a lot of material there too. William seems to have viewed himself as something of a true connoisseur on the European princely model. Um, not only acquiring art, but also with a deep interest in science. His name appears in many different contexts, which we've um, managed to find out for the exhibition. Um, for, for, for example, um, John Greaves, the mathematician and antiquary, wrote the first survey of the pyramids, Pyramidographia, in 1646. And he writes that he met his most good and worthy friend, William Paston, while he was in Cairo. The intelligence of Samuel Hartlib first met William in 1651 and, and references him in his um, notebook and indicates his, in, his interest in, in ingenuities and in medicine. Kenelm Digby also um, mentions uh, William Paston in his Queen's Closet Opened in 1669, um, quoting his recipes for um, various drinks, including mead. 
while Edward Phillips, in The New World of English Words of 1658, comments on the largeness of his mind, his hospitality, and his admirable skill in physic. We've made a great many discoveries in the course of this project, um, but one, one thing that's, that we did discover was a, an anonymous funeral ode for William, who called him Mycenas, and obviously that might be a standard term of flattery for somebody in his position, but here it, it, it does seem as though it had some relevance. As part of uh, um, my job on the project, I was going through some of the many inventories of the decorative arts collection um, and trying to match them up, match up descriptions with what might be, what, what they might refer to. Here is a small um, selection from the, con the contents of the best closet in the new buildings in 1683. Some of them are quite clear what they refer to, others slightly less clear and some of them are quite ambiguous. Um, I did also um, op take a advice from assorted specialists. Uh, Dora Thornton uh, kindly suggested that the George, I mean, I, I knew it was a St. George, but um, that the, the, the word George refers specifically to garter regalia. The Pastons were strong royalists, and they, they were very proud of their long tradition of service to the crown. And uh, they had two garter knights in their immediate ancestry, so we know they had a, a garter badge in their collection. Um, a Magdalen in a rich gilded frame. They, they, had, they had a lot of pictures. The Buxton family purchased um, over 70 pictures from them in 1709, but unfortunately, on the past and inventories, the pictures are very seldom described in any detail. Um, they were more often described in terms of just their size or where they were rather than their subject matter. Um, this is unusual, one Magdalen in a rich gilded frame. And the artist, who, one artist who specialised in paintings of Mary Magdalene was Gaspar Smits um, at the time. And we know that Gaspar Smits was commissioned by the Pastons because there was a, a, an oil portrait of Robert Paston um, that was uh, done by Smits. Um, we weren't able to borrow it for the exhibition, but um, this, 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 this makes uh, this quite a likely candidate for having painted the Magdalene. These are quite interesting. Um, it, was, it is um, apparently relatively common to see um, mounted nautilus shells in the form of ostriches, but much less common in cranes. Um, nobody who I've uh, discussed this with has ever seen any other um, nautilus um, in the form of a crane. And the Pastons had two of these. Um, and uh, they, just, they, they are described twice on two inventories, so they definitely had two. And there are two of them um, which we know about, um, the one from the Ashmolean and one from the Rijksmuseum. So it's quite possible that these could have been the cranes which belonged to the Pastons. These were these uh, gilt bronze horses were not uncommon um, souvenirs from Italian travellers um, in the 17th century, and the Pastons had eight of these. Um, the, the the various different uh, the postures um, are described quite clearly. Um, sometimes they're called brass gilded, and other times silver gilded. Um, at different times, but the inventories were taken by different people. Therefore, you know, they didn't always necessarily know what they were looking at. There are quite a few objects which match descriptions of the Gujarati items. Um, the, uh, the, the, the ewer and seven dishes of Mother of Pearl. There is also a pearl dish with the pearl set in scallops, which seems fairly con conclusive. And sometimes the, the descriptions are ambiguous. One blue cup wrought with a mermaid upon it. Um, when they had several items purely described as blue, which could be porcelain, 
Um, but they, the pastas didn't appear to have very much porcelain, perhaps a dozen pieces at most, and they usually just called them china. So they had um, long china jars, china basins. Um, so um, something that is blue that isn't porcelain could be lapis, which is just possible. Um, one is just w working with the information that one has. Um, sometimes the description sounds slightly incoherent, um, but a pendant for two great agate heads and 18 small ones and 15 small diamonds could well refer to an item of this kind, the, the cameo pendant um, from the Kunstes Dorisches Museum. Similarly, um, I, had, I had never seen um, coconut cups with ivory mounts before. Um, and uh, I found these two in the Kunsthistorisches Museum. Obviously, anything in the Kunsthistorisches Museum couldn't have been belonging to the Pastons, but it's, it's of the kind of object which um, could have been um, in their collection. And they, they, they clearly had a fondness for rock crystal. And as we know that William Paston went to Italy, um, he could well have commissioned rock crystal in Italy. Um, but there was also descriptions of things being six square, which is more of this kind of style, of the, the Freiburg um, style. So it's possible that he had both types. Of the objects in the painting, as I've said, we know where five of them are. Um, the, the, the others we didn't manage to track down, unfortunately. Um, although there are descriptions which match quite closely with the description, with the images of the paintings, the images in the painting. One mother of pearl bottle upon a silver frame gilded with a blackamoor's head on the top of it. It's quite hard to see because this is lying down, but that, when you look at it closely, that is actually a moor's head. You, you do need to look really closely at it in order to see it. One green shell with a silver frame embossed and gilded with a Neptune on the top. Um, obviously, having um, shell cups with Neptunes is not at all um, un unusual. In fact, it's, it's quite a, a common form of decoration for Nautilus shell cups. But less, less usual is the one that leaves the shell um, intact. Um, far more common is to scrape off the top matte layer um, to, to reveal the nacreous layer underneath. Um, but this is this piece here seems very much to describe a turbo marmorata shell in its natural shape. It may be that it was a particularly fine specimen, this shell, or perhaps it was meant to suggest the waves of the sea, and that's why it was um, left there for a particular reason. One of, the, one of the great things about working on this project is that the number of different specialists that we have been able to get to look at the painting. Um, Wolfram Cooper from the Metropolitan Museum has looked at some of these cups and um, he suggested that this one could have been by a, a member of the Van Vianen family. If you look, the, the base is formed of a little grotesque with its mouth open, um, with, with, with its arms up. Up, upheld, and there was another similar at the top there. And he noted that it, it corresponds quite closely with the little figure at the stem there. So it is quite possibly that kind of object. Another quite intriguing object is the, the shell engraving with the story of Atalanta. Um, the Pastons clearly had quite a few engraved shells, but the inventories don't record the subject of the engraving. Um, this is the only one when it tells us actually who it is, and it's, and it's extremely clear. Um, it looks very much um, the eagle's foot. It's, 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 it's very realistic, and it's, um, it seems as though it's in, in, in the mode of the cast eagle's feet, um, such as this example here. Um, in the exhibition, we, we have um, 
managed to borrow this one, um, which is um, which is kind of only naturalistic part of the way up. But th this is actually closer to the um, kind of quite uh, gutsy um, rendition of the eagle's claw and foot. The source of the engraving of Atalanta was quite a puzzle. Um, obviously, the, the best known engraved um, in the engraving workshop in Amsterdam, Cornelis van Bellekin, um, is of not dissimilar style. Um, the Pastons were in Holland. They spent time in Holland. They could easily have commissioned it direct. Um, but uh, the actual source, the print source, we couldn't find. Um, and we did spend a long time trying to find it. And in the end, um, we found this this work and the, the, the discovering the source of the engraving was a kind of a joint effort between myself, Wolfram, and Nathan Fleece from Yale. Um, this is the, the frontispiece of a well-known treatise on alchemy um, by Michael Meyer from 1618 called Atalanta Fugiens. Um, the other thing I did as part of the project was to study the Paston's alchemical interests. And this is, um, I. Atalanta is fugiens, it's Latin for running, um, and so it was that a reference to the book. Um, but when you look, there's, there at the bottom is the story of Atalanta kneeling to pick up her apples, and Hippomenes, who runs, runs before her and wins the race, whereas the figure on the actual cup um, appears to show some kind of a composite um, in, the, in the engraving, Atalanta is much more feminine and is showing and is shown kneeling and therefore losing the race, whereas it's Hippomenes who's winning, whereas the pose is remarkably similar. Um, but it's, it's, it, it looks as if it's some kind of a composite of um, Atalanta, Hippomenes, and the apples. Um, in the book Atalanta Fugiens, um, it's meant to be um, a feast for the eyes, the ears, and the mind is what it's described as. It's words, images, and also music, fugues, and the understanding of those three elements and har harmoniously blending them together is what gives you the, the knowledge of the philosopher's stone, which is the great secret that every alchemist is looking for. And so given that we know that the Pastons were interested in alchemy, um, Robert Paston in particular um, spent 20 years looking for the Philosopher's Stone um, and failing to find it. Um, it could be that, is, is that a, some kind of alchemical conceit which is put into the painting to show the conjunction um, of Atalanta, Hippomenes and the Golden Apples. The whole composition of the painting is so extraordinary that it's like looking into somebody's mind. Um, we've had a great deal of technical analysis done on the painting, um, as, as well as looking for the objects. It's been x-rayed, and it's also had macro XRF imaging done on it, which has enabled us to um, identify every chemical element within the painting and then every pigment which the artist used. And we know that some of the pictures, some of the pigments have fa faded extremely badly, which is one of, the, one of the reasons why the painting looks so odd. The colour balance is out. Um, the red has faded. Um, the, the yellows have, have faded as well. And the Also, the analysis has also revealed this strange area in the right-hand corner. Um, the elliptical, the, the white elliptical area is a silver dish, um, which was the first iteration of that area. Um, and that was painted out. A woman in red was painted in. She was painted out. And then the clock, the black clock that we see today, was painted in. And the analysis of the paint layers shows that there's, there's no dust sandwiched between any of the layers, which suggests it was not done um, with, with, with much time lapse between the three. And th the, way it's been, the way it's been studied, we can tell that it was done all by one hand. It, it, somebody else didn't come and add it later. Um, 
so there's there's a lot going on. There's a lot of mysteries hidden within this picture, both kind of art historical and technical. Um, and it could be one of the things that we haven't managed to establish in the entire five years worth of project is who the artist was, or even the exact date of its commission. Um, everybody who's looked at the picture has not been able to date anything later than the early to mid 1660s, around 1663, 1665. Um, William Paston um, died early in 1663. And it's possible that he commissioned the portrait, the, the painting, to record a selection of his family's treasures. The other thing is we don't know why the choice of these particular treasures. Um, this is a tiny fraction, as we know. They had a couple of hundred of objects like this. Why did they choose those? That's another um, thing to be explored. Um, it's a possibility that William commissioned the painting but then possibly died before it was finished. Um, it has been suggested that the lady in red might have been William's second wife, Margaret. Um, Robert's son, oh, sorry, William's son, Robert, was not getting on well with Lady Margaret at the time, nor indeed with his father when, when William died. And one is, one is, some people have suggested the rather soap opera-ish um, suggestion that William, um, William's wife might have been painted out by, his, uh, by her stepson in a fit of pique um, because she inherited half the family collection, which Robert, the son, might, might have hoped himself to inherit. But one will never know. Um, there's very much a feeling of work in progress with this entire project. Um, I've been working on it for, as I said, five years, other people um, as well, many other people. And I still feel as though in many ways we're only just scratching the surface. Um, new discoveries have, many new discoveries have happened, but more new discoveries are happening all the time. Um, a painting which belonged to the Pastons, um, which contains the arms of William Paston and his second wife, Margaret Hewitt, um, emerged only a couple of months ago. Um, that was too late to go to Yale and is too late to go into the catalogue, but it is on show um, in our exhibition in Norwich. Many thanks to the owners for allowing that to happen. Um, there'll be an article about that um, in the Burlington magazine next month, so I, I won't say any more now. But it's, um, it's, uh, just, it, it just shows how much more there is to find out. With, with William Paston, one very much gets the idea that he saw himself as pursuing art, beauty, riches, but also learning. Um, you don't get the feeling that he was very bothered about status in so far as it, except in so far as it furthered his ability to collect. Robert, his son, was slightly different, however. Um, he, we, we don't know how much he collected. Um, there's evidence probably not very much. He was more, but what we, we, we do know is that he didn't like to get rid of anything. Um, an inventory of the Paston's jewellery collection taken just before William's death on 1663 um, suggests that William wanted the jewellery to be um, sold because it was going to raise some money. They were having money issues by this time in 1663, but none of it was sold off because it appears in the inventory taken after Robert's death. Um, we also know he didn't want his stepmother to have half the collection, so he bought it back. Um, so he was very keen on retaining it, um, but he was also particularly keen on royal status. Um, he had borrowed money while Charles II was in exile in order to give Charles money um, to show his loyalty and his support. And later in life, he was rewarded with first a viscountcy, then an earldom. Um, this print of him um, shows that actually has his earl's coronet on. This is 1679. Um, but it didn't really do, he, he, he wasn't very good at keeping his money. Um, clearly, he's very good at acquiring uh, social status. His eldest son managed to marry one of Charles II's illegitimate daughters, Charlotte, and then he became an earl. So um, Robert was 
very keen, was probably more keen than his father William on status. Um, but sadly, status doesn't mean that, that you can keep everything you have. And he died in so much debt in 1683 that when he passed the debt onto his son, who was also William, William had little or no chance of recovering the family finances. Um, this one's little scrappy receipt is the evidence that tells us that John Buxton, the Norfolk um, f family who happened to be, f to be furnishing a new house at the time, they purchased um, goods, the contents of several rooms in 1709. Um, in the early 18th s s century, the younger William Paston, the second Earl, was having increasing difficulty in keeping up both a London house and a Norfolk house. So a big sale was held in 1709. But upon the second Earl's death in 1732, everything was sold off and the collection um, had been, which, which must have been one of the glories of um, the county, if, if not the country at the time, was dispersed. Um, it was just lucky for Norwich Castle Museum that we managed to have this evidence in the form of this extraordinary painting. Thank you.